197th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a reverse option pass across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's up, guys? Uh, Matt, you're emptying your bag of tricks, man. I, I like it. Uh, it's a it's a Freddy Kitchen Sink game this weekend. There you go. Um, but uh, we can't get started without the third amigo in the second city, a man who may or may not be in the transfer por- portal as of right now. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and <laughs> Counting, Josh Cook. Yeah, thanks for the segue. I wanted to start the show with getting your opinions on the big story out of Houston. Um, several players, probably the uh, most notable is Derek King, the quarterback, uh, senior receiver Keith Corbin also joining this, but uh, they're both seniors. They are both redshirting after playing four games this year. Um, we, all three of us have bet on the record that we love um, some of the new flexibilities for players. Uh, we all liked the transfer rule. We like the redshirt rule. Um, I don't think it was necessarily envisioned to be used by seniors wanting to finish up their degree And now they'll have the option of either staying at Houston, uh, which at least initial comments make it sound like the Eric King is going to do that. Um, Or they can then be grad transfers and leave, which is what Paul Feinbaum and a few other people think is going to happen. If they do stay, though, I mean, how brilliant is this? They get a whole extra year to work in Holgerson's system. And for Derek, Derek King, I believe this is his third head coach and fourth offensive coordinator in college. Um, So that's not ideal exactly, but um, it's a fascinating development. And I was just wondering your guys' thought on a um, unorthodox way to say the least of applying the four game and red shirt rule. Cause I think we thought this was for freshmen and players that unfortunately get hurt. I mean, yeah. It's as far as I'm concerned, if it's it's by the letter of the law. Agreed. And yep. I don't see an argument against it. It fits with what is prescribed by the NCAA. And you know, if if they he played his four games and is going to do that and he's happy with it and his coach is happy with it and the team as a whole is happy with it, who's to say no to him? They agree. Yeah. I mean, so. it, it, it's all it's all determined on on how the team perceives it and and what he's doing in in their eyes. And I think it's one of those things where if everybody's good with it, I'm good with it. He's not doing anything. He's not he's not reaching out to the NCAA and crying for an, for a brand new waiver and all that. You know, making a huge drama show about it. So, um, you know, I, I don't have any issue with it. Uh, as long as everybody else is cool with it, and as long as it's what's best for him and the team, uh, I think all is well. D.R. King been in the news a lot this weekend, also because with uh, Kyle Trask looking so good, everyone keep running up that Kyle Trask was D.R. King's backup in high school. So he hadn't started since he was a freshman. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so God, I mean, um, That could be a quick slant of its own, you know, just Kyle Trask. Well... <laughs> Uh, does it have to be? No, because Tennessee is god awful. They're they god awful. They're a steaming pile of garbage. Oh, Tennessee! I thought you were talking about Austin P. Excuse me. <laughs> they do run. Hey, hey, hey! That's offensive. That's offensive to Austin P. The governors. <laughs> the govs. Oh man, don't do that to Austin P. Don't put them in the same boat as Tennessee. Well, one team that finally showed at least some sign of life this weekend, uh, that was the UCLA Bruins. Uh, For those of you who did not stay up to watch Pac-12 after dark, you missed a dandy. Chip Kelly and UCLA got their first win of the season uh, in a wild one up on the Palouse, uh, putting up a 50-burger in the second half alone. Uh, Comeback win to win 67-63 to over the number 19 Cougars. Bruins were down 32 with four minutes to go in the third quarter. 
uh, pulled off uh, quite an epic comeback led by Demetric Felton. He took a kickoff to the house in the second quarter, also caught seven passes for 150 yards and two touchdowns. Um, in a losing effort, Anthony Gordon for Washington State threw for um, a ho-hum 570 yards and conference uh, record in nine touchdowns. The game had nearly 1,400 yards of total offense. Uh, Washington State managed to turn the ball over six times, and it was a comeback that it will uh, be a while before I do not remember it. It was uh, quite – it was something else. Um, this is coming off of the heels of USC beating Utah uh, on Friday night in the Coliseum. Josh, is football back in Los Angeles? No, I think that – as much as we like the pirate because he's such a character and he says goofy stuff all the time, I think it's fair to say that he coaches in a way that makes his teams undeniably exciting and puts them in contention for overachieving at schools like Texas Tech and Washington State. Um, but his teams are routinely fundamentally flawed in some way and when you play that fast your defense is going to get tired when you play that fast with a bunch of turnovers your defense is going to be gassed and by the end of the game there were tons of hands on hips and I just think that we've seen it before with him that there's kind of a stars align moment for a wacky loss or a heartbreaking loss or a game where they run up against a more physical team. Hell, we saw it a few years ago when the Gophers beat them in a bowl game when they absolutely had no business beating that Washington State team. So uh, I think it's just another uh, kind of check mark in the Pirate and sometimes what happens to Gundy's teams where it's just – they're not complete and they play an exciting brand of football, but they have some head scratching losses. I wouldn't be surprised if UCLA gets blown out, you know, very soon again. Wow. Yeah. I, I was, I, I was, uh, I was surprised by this. Cause I, I, I really, honestly, I was like, Oh, this game's good. This game's a blowout. I, I was starting to fall asleep and <laughs> I was, I was preparing for, uh, our our uh, week six showdown uh, with Good Pasture Christian School and watching film and going back and forth between the Wazoo game and every time I it seemed like every time I looked down uh, I tried to only work during commercials and just try to watch and then I would just start going and going and going and then every, the next thing you know, I look up and watch the state scoring again I was like oh my god this is gonna be bad we're gonna have a lot to talk about here with UCLA this is gonna be fun and then you know I'm starting to fall asleep so I'm like hey, I'm gonna go to bed all right. You know, and my mom turned on Golden Girls and I went upstairs. Thank you for being a friend. Yeah. Um, I wake up and I watch Sports Center for the first time in like years. And I see that <laughs> UCLA scored 67 points to win 67 63. The most insane thing I've ever seen. I was like, what the hell did I miss? So, yeah, very impressive uh, for Chip Kelly. And their bunch uh, seems like I didn't see how they did it, but it seems like they <laughs> took advantage of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, That's and, a pretty much how most people feel about UCLA football. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, tough loss for the Pirate, um, no doubt. Yeah, that game uh, had a wild ending. Another game that had uh, a unique ending, Josh, was your newly adopted Eastern Michigan Eagles needing a punt block uh, in late in the fourth quarter to beat Central Connecticut State. Yeah, baby. Uh, I think it was just a nice recipe for uh, this to be a competitive game. Not that you expect it uh, to end in this way, but uh, Central Connecticut uh, undefeated coming into this game and a really – nice looking offense they were coming off back to back 40 point games uh their offense got rolling nicely they have a really efficient passing attack maybe an eye to keep keep an eye on this kid down in the fcs but aaron winchester 17 to 22 231 for the blue devils of central connecticut not duke but as you mentioned what an exciting finish so um 
not just down to the wire, but how about the uh, punt block happening? Does anyone want to pose a time how much left they think was in the game? One thirteen. Way too uh, much. <laughs> oh, like like forty six. Uh, try ten seconds. Oh god, left oh, in the game. Uh, they blocked the punt, scooped and scored uh, to to pull it off. Uh, pretty exciting stuff in terms of Eastern Michigan. You know, maybe they were poking their eyes ahead just a little bit because they have a rival next week in the MAC. But um, nice win for ECU. They're three and one. Um, have to feel pretty good about making a bowl. Um, not that it's guaranteed or wrapped up yet, but Central Michigan a struggle. Ball State struggled this year. Western Michigan, not a vintage Western Michigan team. Akron struggling. So uh, there's wins to be had there for this Eastern Michigan team. And uh, appointment TV, they had an exciting game against Illinois and now an exciting game against Central Connecticut. Watch the scream and Mean Eagles. Um, yeah, and – uh, unfortunately, Coach, for you, your uh, Georgia State Panthers uh, lost to the uh, pretty putrid Texas State Bobcats. Not quite sure how that happened. San Marcos. Yeah, God, yeah, San Marcos is a trap, apparently. Um, <laughs> they, I, I mean, oh, it was, tri- it was a, it, a triple overtime game. I guess the two and ten is coming back at coming back out at them. Um, that was that was they, that was bad. They just needed to schedule Tennessee twelve times. I don't know if they if they could do that, they go twelve and zero and be in the college football playoff. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so Georgia State uh, losers yet again. Um, looks like it's going to be a rough go for them. Looks like uh, looks like I might my phone might be ringing here pretty soon. Um, <laughs> you can't change adoptions. <laughs> What? You don't get to oh. you don't get to give the kids back. What? That's not how this works. No, listen, listen. My phone's gonna ring and they're gonna they're gonna call me down to come coach the team. Guys, relax. Chill out. <laughs> then I'm really adopting. Um. So, uh, for my additional quick slant, um, I wanted to quickly slant around the SEC, uh, and and mention some games that are not in our deep routes. So, mm. um. Uh, Alabama had a nail biter, uh, forty nine to seven, uh, to a tongue oh. fight, seventeen to twenty one for two ninety three and five touchdowns. So uh, pretty decent day. Henry Ruggs was the leading receiver for catches, one hundred forty eight and two touchdowns. So um, yeah, Alabama struggled forty nine seven over the mustard buzzards. Uh, Vanderbilt putting up thirty eight, uh, very good day against LSU. Unfortunately, though. Um, your defense can't give up 66 Mm. uh, to number four ranked LSU. Joe Burrow had almost 400, was two yards shy of 400, uh, 25 of 34 for six touchdowns. Although Keyshawn Vaughn uh, starred for the anchor downs, uh, 20 carries, 130 and two touchdowns for him. Jamar Chase, 10 catches, 229 and four touchdowns. Um, we mentioned a mo- moments ago, uh, old Rocky Top. Uh, they they really showed uh, showed what they had against the Florida Gators, uh, which is not much. Um, <laughs> Thirty four to three, they fell victim. The the one of the highlights, or I don't know if you'd call it a highlight or a low light or whatever, it depends on who you ask, really. Um, but Jared Guarantano or Guarantano, I think is what he's what he's want to be called, Guarantano. Um, through, got flushed from the pocket, and so he's been hit so many times that he just there was nobody around him, and he just threw one. Uh, there was no receiver in sight. It, if this ball would have hit the ground, it would have been intentional grounding. But there was there was a uh, Florida DB in the area, and he made the pick. So um, that was the highlight of the game for for the uh, Tennessee Vols. Uh, Kyle Trask again continued a pretty good story although they played a JV team uh, <laughs> so yeah there you go Florida thinking you know they're they're ranked ninth in the country and well uh, they've been kind of fortunate so uh, the one of the the undercard game of the week really um, was Cal 2820 over Ole Miss and would Can you we get a reverse angle by the way on that pass <laughs> yeah I know right 
Um, so would you believe it if I told you that Cal's defense stopped Ole Miss at the one yard line to to win the game to finish out the game? I mean, if there's any team that's going to do it, it's going to be Cal. Exactly. Um, and Chase Gar- Chase Garbers, uh, twenty five of thirty five, three fifty seven, four touchdowns. So Cal's offense actually showing up pretty good. So um, that was good. The battle of the heartbreakers, the battle of the rebounders. Uh, Mississippi State took that one. Garrett Schrader was actually the leading rusher in the game. Eleven carries, one hundred twenty five. Sawyer Smith uh, had a had an off day. Fifteen of forty one for two thirty two mm. and a pick. So uh, Mississippi State's defense. The other Bulldogs were were stingy over there. And in the play of the game, really, the the highlight of the game was Kylan Hill going up and over uh, for one of his uh, touchdowns. Uh, pretty impressive there. So Mississippi State getting back on track. Kentucky. Uh, falls to two and two, and they got to figure out some things. Um, Missouri, the non bowl eligible uh, Missouri Tigers, three and one with a 34 to 14 win over South Carolina, sending defensive back Jemias Williams into the transfer portal. Um, <laughs> Tyler Helinski throws a hundred yard pick six. Um, Kelly Bryant had a uh, pedestrian day, but they were victorious. Larry Roundtree, 23 carries for 88 yards. Um, and I think that wraps up the SEC. So let's talk about uh, some teams that have yet to get a win on the year. I'm going to rank these from stick a fork in them to uh, teams that might be able to bounce back. So stick a fork in Massachusetts. Uh, they've given up 48, 45, 52, and 62. And they've played the murderer's row of Rutgers, Southern Illinois, Charlotte, and Coastal Carolina. But that Chanticleer team is actually kind of an interesting story. Keep an eye on them. Uh, but stick a fork in UMass. Uh, they have Akron next, who even if Akron wins this game to get off this night, uh, stick a fork in them. They have struggled mightily in their 0-4 start. They're coming off a 35-7 to home loss to a Sunbelt team. They already have a conference loss to Central Michigan, 45-24, a CNU team that's not very good either central michigan does antonio brown have any eligibility left (laughs) i don't believe he does uh so stick a fork at akron uh new mexico state stick a fork in them as well um they've played a pretty tough schedule with washington state alabama san diego state before their rivalry game but um yeah they just they're not scoring very much against decent teams and against new mexico they're defense fell apart so outside of those two games against liberty and an fcs game um tough to see them really doing too much in the way of making waves so uh rice i had a hold on them i still have a hold on them i know they're zero and four but they had a one possession loss at army and a one possession loss to baylor uh they're scrapping they finally hit conference usa play Uh, maybe they can string a few wins together in that conference, maybe somehow find a way to finish six and two. Who knows? That's a stretch, but I am not out on the Owls just quite yet. And then lastly, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, they are a winless team, but they're only 0-3, so they have a little bit of extra time. But their schedule um, opens up a little bit. They have Northern Illinois, Mississippi, UNLV, a good chance to win all three of those get back to 500 ball. And then they have Missouri, who's kind of up and down. South Carolina, which is really struggling. Uh, Florida, which obviously that'll be a tough road trip. But then Kentucky, which has had some ups and downs. And then they end with East Tennessee State and Tennessee. So um, they still have a very good chance, I think, of making a bowl. I think they win that Northern game, the Mississippi game, South Carolina game, ETSU. Tennessee, and then um, maybe they split Kentucky, Missouri, something like that. So I I, I like this team to still make a bowl. Yeah, I, you know, I I would certainly hope that uh, Vandy's able to make a bowl. But, um, you know, we'll see. Well, I I think uh, the Northern Illinois game will, you know, if if Vandy doesn't, if if Vandy loses that one, it, it, all the wheels could start falling off. Yeah, they could. But. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's uh, it's barely hanging on by a thread anyway. 
So um, anyway, my adopted team, uh, East Carolina, uh, they uh, they beat uh, William and Mary. Um, wasn't the prettiest of games. Um, they won nineteen to seven, even though they doubled them up in, in total yards. Uh, but they uh, had to settle for five field goal attempts, making four of them completely inefficient in the red zone. And uh, that is not going to uh, bode well for them um, moving forward in the American Conference. Uh, speaking of the American, uh, last thing before we get to our deep roots, I uh, want to give a shout out uh, to uh, those very handsome SMU uniforms and the ponies winning the Iron Skillet over the Horn Frogs, uh, 41 to 38. Shane Bouchel, Josh, uh, former Texas quarterback, he looked uh, pretty darn good against mm-hmm. a typically stingy Gary Patterson defense. I mean, they were going to look good losing that game 62 to nothing. It looks even better dressed that way. That was hats off to Sonny Dykes, SMU 4 0. Uh, we don't have a pop quiz today. Uh, So I'm going to give you guys a one-question pop quiz. Does anyone know how William & Mary got the name William & Mary? (laughs) I'm assuming it's a king and a queen of some sort. Uh, Got to be more specific than that. My friend William and his girlfriend Mary, uh, they decided (laughs) they would have found a college and – so they couldn't really think of a name, so they just used William and Mary. William there the third go. and Mary the second. There you go. Uh, here's the super quick answer. England had a Catholic king, but everyone was a member of the Church of England. They didn't like that. So they had a peaceful revolution called the Glorious Revolution. The king's daughter, Mary, was married to the king of the Dutch. William and they overthrew her dad. They were married, William and Mary. There you go. Well, thank you there, uh, <laughs> Mr. Cook. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? You both failed. <laughs> well, that's not very nice. <laughs> well, then, with that, on that down note, we have to head to our deep <laughs> roots. Um, we are feeling I don't know. Actually, I don't know if Notre Dame fans are feeling really sad today. They played pretty darn well against uh, against your dogs, Coach. Yeah, well, as the biggest Georgia fan, I'll chime in <laughs> first. <laughs> Take it away, Coach. Yeah, um, I thought that Notre Dame, you know, looked good at times, but Ian Book uh, also, you know, he doesn't seem to attempt any passes further than ten yards down the field, and so. I felt like Georgia was just able to make them really one-dimensional. Yeah, they were. I mean, Georgia sold out to uh, stop the run, and uh, they sold out to not give up any deep balls, which they succeeded in both of those things. Uh, they held Notre Dame to forty, just 46 yards on the ground. Uh, they frustrated Ian Book most of the night. The only thing they couldn't really figure out was how to cover Cole Komet, and uh, – he had a big day, nine catches, 108 yards, and one touchdown. Uh, so the defense defense came to play. They were physical. They were flying around. Uh, J.R. Reed just made one of the most incredible uh, – look, looked like shades of Ed Reed uh, coming from the middle of the field and making a diving interception on a flea flicker uh, where they flushed uh, Ian Book out of the pocket. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they forced, they forced Notre Dame to be patient with their drives. Uh, that ended up not working for Notre Dame. Um, and so that that ended up being one of the differences in the game as far as slowing them down. So, um, you know, a couple other things with this game. Uh, so much of the feedback from the Georgia fans, uh, probably the biggest thing, and we, we talked about this on the group chat, was the decision not to go for it on fourth and one when you had it deep in your own territory. Um instead electing to kick a field goal and going up by two uh, possessions, forcing Notre Dame to score two touchdowns to win. Um, I didn't, I didn't particularly like the call. Um, I, I would have gone for it myself, but in thinking about it, I kind of understand where he was going with that. And I understand why he 
uh, why Kirby made the decision to do what he did because he felt like time was on his side. Uh, Notre Dame had burnt two crucial timeouts earlier in the half uh, due to crowd noise. And so Kirby felt like they were at an advantage as far as forcing them to score two touchdowns. They did, he didn't feel like they could do that in, a, in the amount of time that they had and the hostileness of the environment. Little did he know that they would go down and score one. Uh, we, Georgia would get the ball back. The punter would shank it and give it to him at midfield. So um, gave everybody kind of a heart attack uh, there. If the punter puts his – puts a good boot on it maybe we're talking about maybe it's not as close as as we thought so uh, a couple other things DeAndre Swift two yards shy of 100 yards he looked good looked comfortable especially in the second half um, Lawrence Cager was absolutely outstanding uh, he was one of Jake Fromm's biggest targets catching a, a back shoulder touchdown where he where he had to act or be an acrobat and get his right foot down as he was twisting and turning through the air on a 15-yard touchdown pass early in the fourth. Um, just a lot of impressive things. Uh, Notre Dame really impressed me uh, with how physical they played. Uh, they sold out against the run. Their inside linebackers played really well. Um, and I, I thought they did a lot of good things on the defensive side of the ball. They tackled well in space, which is something uh, that gives Georgia fits as far as the short passing game. And some guy named Jake Fromm, uh, he, uh, he managed the game extremely well. Uh, he, was, he was on point. He was dialed in. He, he, was, he, was making, he was making great checks. He was making NFL throws, uh, m- most notably the one where he threw from the right hash all the way to the sideline on a deep out route uh, was probably one of the more impressive throws. Some of the tight windows he put the ball in just kind of showed his growth and, and being able to, when he needs to, take the team on his back and, and lead him down the field and not just have to rely on uh, DeAndre Swift to do all the, the heavy lifting. Yeah, I want to build on something you said, Coach. Uh, you mentioned a poor rushing day for Notre Dame with just 46 yards. Yeah, Georgia has a great defense. Yeah, Georgia you know, made them one-dimensional and said, hey, Ian Book beat us, but – Notre Dame also just beat themselves a little bit with some poor play calling. From those 46 rushing yards, 14 carries. That's it. And nine carries for Tony Jones Jr. Um, it reminded me in many ways, uh, the game didn't get out, out of control as much, but reminded me in many ways of the Wisconsin-Michigan game a year ago in which Wisconsin inexplicably stopped running the ball. And it's like, yeah, getting two yards is kind of ugly, but all it takes is like one or two runs to open things up a little bit. Or if you manage to get a little bit more leverage and turn that two yards into three yards, which, oh, hey, look, they were averaging 3.3 yards per carry. Um, hello, Woody Hayes, three, cloud, three yards in a cloud of dust. You can make first downs with three yards rushing. I don't know why you pack it in after 14 carries and then give Ian book 47 passing plays and tell him, Hey, yep. Go beat Georgia. It's not a recipe for success. No. And especially when you're burning timeouts and I think they had double digit false starts too. And they were, they were consistently behind the chains, which made it tough. Yeah. I mean, Notre Dame had 12 penalties for a hundred for, sorry, for, for 85 yards, um, which, you know, did not help them at all. And, you know, it, it never really felt like in the second half, it always felt like Georgia was going to win, but Notre Dame just hung around and hung around and kept it close. And uh, they fought through it a little bit more than I anticipated. Uh, they put up a tougher test than I, I – I thought Georgia would win by 14 points here. So uh, I, w- I was surprised that Notre Dame hung around so well. But I really feel like – Notre Dame needs to get a downfield passing game working if they are ever going to be able to beat a top five team at some point moving forward. Um, So let's move on then to um, another uh, SEC game. Uh, This time Auburn uh, went into College Station uh, and beat Texas A&M 28-20. to Coach, uh, Bo Nix isn't uh, the, isn't necessarily the prettiest quarterbacks 
uh, Purdue's quarterback, but he's been getting it done, and he gets uh, another uh, big road win for the Tigers. Yeah, I mean, I'm thoroughly impressed with what this uh, Auburn team is doing. I know in the, I know in the preview, I said they needed to figure out what they're doing at the quarterback position, and then I didn't know or didn't, wasn't sure that they knew what they were doing. But I, I think what you're starting to see is kind of like Joey Gatewood being coming in as kind of like the changeup quarterback. You know, kind of just the he's not they're not really in a controversy where they can't figure out who they want. Um, they just bring in Joey Gatewood, kind of like you know, kind of like other teams will bring in like a Wildcat quarterback, except Joey Gatewood's an actual quarterback. So, um, so it's it's interesting to see kind of how they're handling that, and it seems like they're handling it really well. Which, which I guess if you're an Auburn fan, kind of puts you at ease because anytime you have a quarterback situation like that, it can always get tricky. Um, but. Um, the key uh, for Auburn right now is their defense is really just uh, helping them out and giving them chances and giving them opportunities and, and allowing Bo Nix to be a freshman sometimes and bail him out and pick him up. And, and, and that's what's going to make Auburn dangerous down the stretch because Bo Nix is only going to get better with experience. Uh, they have Jatarius Whitlow, um, and uh, he, he's he's kind of taking some pressure off Bo Nix as well. And they're just they're – just, playing in sync right now and and this is this is an Auburn team that is picking up steam they're getting better each and every week um they're a team that was trying to find every way possible to fire Gus Malzahn last year uh they've kind of since rallied around it I think uh Bo Nix fits into to Malzahn's system better than Stidham did which Stidham I felt like uh after watching this team it, I felt like Stidham was more of the issue because he just didn't fit. He was more of a fish out of water. And Stidham's actually a really good quarterback as evidence that he beat out Brian Hoyer for in, in New England to become Tom Brady's backup. Um, so, And he actually got some game reps, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago against the Jets. So it, it, it's not an issue of talent. It's an issue of fit. And, and Bo Nix really fits Malz- what Malzahn's doing right now. And, and, and when Malzahn has a quarterback like that um, to pair with this defense, they're a dangerous, they're a dangerous ball club. Yeah, um, they definitely are, Josh. And um, I don't know, uh, did you have anything you wanted to add here on this game? Yeah, I, I felt like Texas A&M just spoiled a perfect opportunity. I mean, Bo Nix, 100 passing yards, that's it. Uh, not a very good day for the Auburn Tiger offense, despite putting up 28 points. I was pretty unimpressed. But, you know, everything that felt like it could go wrong for the Aggies went wrong. They missed uh, a field goal that's under 40 yards. So it could have been 7-3 to three early. Um, and then classic Jimbo Fisher – 34 seconds left in the first half. You're across the 50. You're at the Auburn 47. So you're at midfield, but a little bit past. Um, Auburn has already used some of their timeouts. So unless you think Auburn, which hasn't done anything all second quarter and can't pass it, is going to march 53 yards in 30 seconds, why do you punt with a fourth and five? That is what I like to call play not to lose. And then in the second half, you're down 28-13. You get a first and goal at the two-yard line. You can't punch it in. And on top of that, you take a uh, penalty, take a false start penalty, so you, that your third down is at the six and your fourth and goal is at the six. Um, yeah, I guess the field goal made it a 15 point game, but like, come on, punch it in. It's late in the game. It's in the fourth quarter. There's just five minutes left. Like, I feel like a field goal is just waving the white flag. Cause how are you going to score 15 points in five and a half minutes? I would have gone for the touchdown there. I would have played aggressive, uh, but it's Jimbo Fisher. He never really ever plays aggressive. It's one of the many reasons. He got run out of Tallahassee, and it's going to be just his M.O. He's not aggressive. He 
plays not to lose and it bites his butt in some games and this is one of them well uh let's stick in the great state of texas uh and just head over uh from college station to uh i guess their former in-state rival uh ut uh the longhorns uh, beat Oklahoma State uh, in Austin for the first time in a decade, 36 to 30. Uh, Sam Ellinger had himself another uh, efficient day through the air, uh, 20 of 28, 281 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, Chuba Hubbard uh, got 121 yards for the Pokes, but he needed 37 carries uh, to get there. Josh, um, you know, uh, Mike Gundy broke my heart again. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Are you surprised that Tom Herman actually got a decent win? Or yeah, is it tad, even? Uh, well, I'm a tad surprised. I mean, it's an unranked Oklahoma State team at home. Uh, yeah, Chuba Hubbard needed 37 carries, but uh, let's not make it sound like the Pokes struggled to move the ball or run the ball. Uh, they had 226 rushing yards, and Spencer Sanders had a 6.1 yards per carry average, having over 100 yards on 18 carries. Um, the, the Texas defense didn't look particularly good. Here's the problem. Oklahoma State, two turnovers through two picks. Texas had three turnovers. If they had found a way to win the turnover margin by more than one, if it had been three, nothing, they're in a great position to win penalties. Oklahoma State, nine to six. Penalty yards, 69 to 65, kind of a wash in terms of yardage, but those penalties, three extra ones, you can't do that. It's I know it's very, very minor, but when you are a road dog, you need to figure out how to limit your mistakes, and they just didn't. And that's the frustrating thing if you're an Oklahoma State fan. Um, on top of that, those interceptions kind of coming at uh, not exactly – ideal times to say the least um one came right after texas's first touchdown and then it led to a short field for texas to go up 14 to 3 that's a bad place for your interception um and then the other one it was in the second half you are trying to mount your comeback texas just scored a touchdown to go up 36 23 you're having kind of a nice drive, eight play drive so far, and then you throw an interception. Um, yes, they forced a punt after that, but still, that's a second half interception when you're desperately trying to mount a comeback. So Oklahoma State, they just not did not play clean enough football to win on the road. Well said, dude. Well said. I mean, it just, I you know, I checked in on this game a little bit. This game was running concurrent to. Uh, the Georgia Notre Dame game, which uh, for those of you who don't know me, if you're new, a listener, I was, you could probably guess I was focusing on what was going on in Athens. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough, tough task to, to be able to um, stop or at least stop them enough. Uh, Chuba Howard and Tylen Wallace, those are two um, elite playmakers. And, you know they they made stops when they had to. They they uh, they found a way to overcome three turnovers, which is which is always something good to play. Um, Sam Ellinger um, again made crucial plays down the str- especially down the stretch. You know to to ice the game away. Um, but you know for Oklahoma State, you know from from what I from what I noticed, if they had a reliable kicker, again we go to special teams. Um, they would have, um, they they may would have had a chance to to um, to win this game and, and to hold off and, and hold off Texas, but uh, they 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 didn't. Um, you know, Mike Gundy, uh, one of his quotes was says, "We kick too many field goals. I'd rather punch it in. I'd rather not talk about fakes." So, um, yeah, talking about the fake field goal early in the fourth. Um, Again, uh, fake special teams plays. Um, going back to the 2018 SEC Championship gives me nightmares anytime I see some sort of punt fake or field goal fake. And uh, it seems like every time I see one, it's either getting called back or getting stuffed and blown up. So uh, I'm going to stay away from that stuff. 
that's my takeaways from my limited uh, from my limited viewing of this game. Uh, good for Texas. Um, again, see why I'm not buying Oklahoma State as much um, because they like to let you down uh, in situations like this. Mike Gundy, I can't quit you. Anyway, uh, a team that didn't let us down for the first time in 27 regular season games, that would be the UCF Knights. Uh, they lost um, in Pittsburgh, Josh, 35 to 34 on the Pitt special, I guess you would call it, <laughs> um, with the uh, pass from Aaron Matthews to quarterback Kenny Pickett uh, to win the game. Uh, that was a crazy, crazy back and forth game. Pitt got up uh, big early. UCF made a huge run uh, towards the end of the first half and then into the third quarter. Pitt comes back at the end to win it. Uh, it was a uh, it, this one, Josh, was maybe the most uh, entertaining from a purely football perspective of the day. Yeah, and I mean, look, I, I been one of the leaders of the Central Florida bandwagon. I'm by far their biggest supporter on this show. I'm the only one that said they uh, were worthy of a national title a few years ago. Uh, If they'd gone undefeated, I would have had them in my playoffs without question. I don't know about you, Matt. I feel like you're a yes. I feel like Coach rooting for the SEC probably uh, maybe not as high on them. But um, I actually think that there is something to be said about how well you play in a defeat and how well you can kind of crawl back when everything goes wrong. I mean, you just look at the list of stuff that went wrong uh, for this team Uh, down seven, nothing. They have a nice drive going a classic central Florida drive, three plays, 47 yards, 50 seconds. Uh, They're inside the pit 30 interception backbreaker early um believe it or not then an even bigger backbreaker there's gonna be a lot of backbreakers for central florida it was just that type of game if you're bringing Um, your back that much that's a really bad sign yeah uh 14 down 14 nothing red zone interception second and 10 at the pit 17 yikes uh and then you know credit their defense they held Pitt scoreless on both those drives, but those are points off the board for Central Florida. And then down 14 nothing, the blocked punt return for a touchdown, down 21 nothing. A uh, lot of teams pack it in at that point. Uh, the next drive for Central Florida didn't even go very well. They had to punt uh, <laughs> five plays after the block, um, but they scored before half. Uh, they made it 21-7. Uh, they got things going in the second half. They scored a touchdown and they returned a touchdown or returned a punt for a touchdown to get a 24 21 lead. Um, and then you mentioned the Philly slash Pitt special to win the game. Uh, we talked about Mr. Narduzzi with some questionable calls against Penn State and coaching very, very conservatively. Maybe he listens to the show. Um, but here's where you have to feel just like, man, it Definitely. was not. Yeah. Uh, this is where you have to feel like, man, it just was not our day if you're a Central Florida fan. So that very first interception, they're inside the 30, probably going to make at least three points. Uh, the interception deep in the red zone, got to feel like, that's three points at the very least if you're getting a field goal. Up 31-28, they have a nice seven-play, 63-yard drive. They get a fourth and two at the pit 15. They go for it. You sort of figure if they can make another touchdown, they'll be up 10. Uh, but if it had played out differently, if they had had those other six points um, and everything else plays out the same, it would have been 37-28. You figure they take those points to go up 40 to 28, um, you know, working backwards. And it's just, uh, it it was one of those days where literally everything that could go wrong went wrong. That's how upsets happen. That's how upsets happen to Ohio State. That's how upsets happen to Alabama whenever they do happen. But 
for UCF, what impressed me, down 21 nothing, they fought all the way back. They very easily could have won this game. There were a few plays away from winning this game, even despite the horrible start. And uh, I just – I don't like throwing Ohio State under the bus, but it reminded me of the Purdue game last year in that everything that went wrong for Ohio State could go wrong. And they totally packed it in, and they stopped playing, and they just got worked. Central Florida found that strength. They battled all the way back, and they damn nearly won this game. So very impressive performance despite the loss, and I still love Central Florida. Wow, i got to follow that. <laughs> pick, pick me apart now. <laughs> all right. Um, well, it, it's a It's a classic debate strategy where you force your opponent to defend Pat Narduzzi. Yeah, see, that I can't live like that. <laughs> All I can do is say, uh, he said F him on TV, <laughs> on national <laughs> TV. So, uh, it, mad props to that. Mad props for the guts to call the, the, the pit special. And, I mean, they just had a good game plan. They, you know, they, they really kind of bounced back after a lackluster performance. Uh, Pat Narduzzi was getting a lot of heat. Um, and uh, he really kind of came out and proved that, hey, you know, I can still coach. I can still be a head coach. I can still get my team prepared. Um, even, even though UCF made a lot of mistakes to help them get there, that's football. That happens. Well, you get you have to capitalize. It, it takes two to tango. <laughs> yeah, well, Pitt had to, you know, battle through a lot of their own uh, injuries to their team, especially in the secondary. Uh, they were – uh, they had guys, their corners were dropping like flies. And, you know, Narduzzi's defense had to adapt on the fly to the Central Florida passing attack. And, you know, they were able to limit the damage enough to pull out the game. So um, that was uh, that was a fun one. One game, uh, our final game, that was never in doubt uh, from pretty much the moment it began when Wisconsin got the ball and debuted uh, my new favorite thing about college football, the hippo formation. Uh, for those of you unaware, the hippo formation involves not five, not six, not seven, but eight offensive linemen, um, a quarterback, a tight end, and a tailback. In this case, Jonathan Taylor. Uh, the Badgers used this on four of the first uh, eight, eight plays in their first drive, uh, which ended in a touchdown for the Badgers. Uh, they went on to win this one 35-14 to 14 over Michigan. It wasn't even that close. Uh, Wisconsin's uh, ground game absolutely swallowed up Michigan. The defense was flying all over the place. Michigan turned the ball over four times. Wisconsin did not turn the ball over at all. Uh, out, uh, outgained them by 200 yards. Josh, it was just a thorough beatdown by the Badgers. It was so it, much fun to watch. Yeah. Um, and it was so obvious from the, the get go. I just wanted to read a few of my favorite texts from the game. So at 11, 11 central. So uh, 10 minutes into the game, uh, just after their first touchdown, I texted you, both of you, this is not to jinx Wisconsin, but if they don't abandon the running game, like last year, Michigan is screwed. OL is eating <laughs> them up that's the very first drive and that was the tone of the game um jonathan taylor 203 yards 23 carries and um missed large portion of the game uh for a cramp and yet uh groshek came in and had some nice runs shaw had some nice runs also during that absence uh jack Cohn just kind of uh wandered in for a 25 yard touchdown run so that was kind of fun uh, he was also extremely efficient passing the ball. Uh, when we did our preview, we were struggling to split hairs between Wisconsin and Iowa before a game had been played. I think through uh, three games for each team now, Wisconsin had an early bye. Iowa was on the bye this week through three games. I think it's very, very clear that Wisconsin is head and shoulders above Iowa. And the only prayer that Iowa has um, and potentially – uh, Nebraska, although I, I don't see that happening, but there are some who still think Nebraska can win the West. Um, 
but any prayer for Iowa is going to come down to just Iowa having an easier schedule and maybe Wisconsin loses um, at Ohio state. No shame in that. Maybe they get tripped up by Michigan state, a good defensive team, who knows? Um, But Wisconsin is head and shoulders above Iowa. Uh, Switching gears though to Michigan. And um, I think the analysis on this team is pretty easy to make. Uh, They're turnover prone. They've turned over the ball on their first drive every game now. Um, Shea Patterson just not seeing the field particularly well. And you can't really blame him when the offensive line is for teams that were ranked in the beginning of the season. So of those 25 teams, I'm hard pressed to find an offensive line playing worse than Michigan's. They have totally failed to live up to expectations. And then lastly, dating back to last year, the Ohio State game, the bowl game against Florida, and now Wisconsin, um, there's something very obvious now about Don Brown's defense, and that is it is so aggressive and so blitz-happy that it eats up the Rutgers of the world. But when you do that against competent teams and teams with good offensive lines, all you're doing is putting yourself out of position. And I think a classic example of this was in a goal-to-go situation. Wisconsin is doing a quarterback sneak. Michigan is in an all-out run blitz with no one over the center. Like, what? How is that defense? He had, he was untouched. <laughs> he was yeah. untouched on a quarterback sneak from, like, the half-foot yes. line. And I say all of this as I – Knock on some wood because Iowa plays Michigan very, very soon. And I have a feeling knowing the Brian Ferris brain trust, they will pop in the VHS of this game and see Wisconsin run the ball 57 times. And those 57 touches will be on the hand of their quarterback throwing, and they will do the exact opposite game plan and lose and piss me off. But the, the book for well-coached teams is out on Michigan. And um, I'm not saying that Harbaugh needs to be fired at the end of the year. I think that might be a little bit overkill. But I do think he needs to blow up his staff. And I'm sorry, Don Brown's defense is just getting waxed now by well-coached teams. And there ain't any coming back from this well, if you're going to play – good football you saw that happen coach on the 73 yard uh carry for jonathan taylor when he was completely untouched and as soon as jack Cohn puts the receiver in motion and he sees the safety basically tracking away from where the play is going to be he just calls for a quick uh, audible to switch sides uh of the handoff he goes to the left side and there's not a, a wolverine within 10 yards of him the entire time no, I mean, it, it was very surprising um, to see that not a soul was with them. And just to see Jonathan Taylor, I mean, it, 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 I've gotten so used to seeing Jonathan Taylor just running up and down the field, but not against Michigan. I didn't expect that to be against Michigan. I expect that to be against Eastern Michigan. Sorry, <laughs> Josh. Oh, um, come on. At I, least say Rutgers. I, well, I was going with the Michigan theme here. I expected to see it <laughs> against Michigan Tech. Um, oh, the Youpers. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you know, Finlandia University, also of the Upper Peninsula. Um, <laughs> yeah. How about your random in it? How about your random D3 reference? Finlandia uh, University? I thought Finlandia was a vodka. It oh. is. It's both. There are um, some very upset Lake Superior State fans out there. Hey, they have a couple of national titles in hockey. They would lock down Jonathan Taylor better than Michigan, just so you know. Um, but, no, I mean, in, in all seriousness, I mean, there's no energy up there. It, it's like it's just dead. Like, there's nobody, like, nobody getting mad on the sidelines. It just Everyone just looked comatose, looked like they just wanted to be anywhere but – where they were. They, their defense to me seems like Khalid Hudson and just 10 dudes who like don't really, who are like. And even Khalid Hudson energy. doesn't 
really doesn't seem like he really cares all the time. It doesn't seem like he's checked in. It doesn't seem like any of them are really fully dialed in. I'll tell you who's dialed in is the Wisconsin defense, and that is led by yeah. Zach. That is led by Zach Bond, who, yeah. as a senior outside line blacker, has Very impressive uh, completely blossomed. Mm-hmm. And he is the heart and soul of that defense. Him and Chris Orr, the senior middle linebacker, and um, I know that the uh, the middle backers have uh, gone to calling themselves Death Row, <laughs> so they've got that going for them. And hey, the, uh, the we Wisconsin- also we also spawned a new formation um, outside of the in in reference to the hippo formation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to put it in this week. It's called the Charmin formation. And what's that? It's where you get eight wide receivers and put them <laughs> in the game uh, so that they're extra soft because you know they're not like offensive linemen. So we're yeah. going to call it the Charmin, Charmin formation. So, I don't feel like that's going to go very well. Is, it, is that is that not going to work? Should no, I, I don't think that's going to work. Should I throw that page out? Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I, I don't see the. I don't. I don't see the upside in that one. Tumbling up now, I'm throwing it out. All right. Kobe. <laughs> All right. As you were. Uh, so, yeah. I made it, by the way. Um, I mean, you called Kobe, so you called game. Yeah. Um, this was th- this was just fun to watch as a Badger fan. Um, I think the most exciting thing for me is the Wisconsin defense. They didn't give up points until – the end of the third quarter. That was the first points they'd give up this entire season. Starting the year out with 10 consecutive quarters of shutout ball was they're the first team to do that, I think, since like 1980. Um, and that was the South Carolina team that I believe went on to win the title uh, that season. And the, you know, after having a, a really disappointing year last year, and a lot of that was on the defense that did not. Um, do well. There, there are a couple of things about this Wisconsin team that are back that I really like. Um, quarterback also might have played a minor role. Okay, so yes, the fact that it's no longer Hornerbrook, the fact that it's Jack Cohn, the fact that hey, don't, on, on bang, the, don't bang on Hornerbrook. He saved Florida State's hide. He did. He did, and good for him. But we're this is uh, we, we're living in a post Hornerbrook. Uh, universe now, and I just want to talk about Jack Cohn. I want to talk about Paul Chris. Uh, <laughs> play calling and the confidence he had in both the offense and the defense on the first drive of the game the badgers had it at fourth and one at their own 35 and without hesitation paul chris went for it lined up in lined up in the hippo and got the two yards with jonathan taylor they kept going uh they went down scored a touchdown what that told me was one he had confidence in his offense that they can get the one yard and get enough confidence in his defense that if they were put in that position, they weren't going to give up, um, you know, uh, that they weren't going to be intimidated by Michigan. And they had no reason to be because they, um, you know, Michigan just was a completely one dimensional team. Um, Michigan was 0 for 11 on third down. Um, Michigan had a total of uh four first downs wisconsin had five rushing touchdowns this was uh just a complete domination um but the other thing that really impressed me was uh, a little bit later on in the game uh fourth and three uh and the wisconsin uh uh play call was to run a um uh run a slot fade to uh quintez cephas who has been the best receiver uh, on the team this year and you know classic fourth and three Wisconsin you think they're gonna line up hand the ball to Jonathan Taylor well uh, Chris had enough confidence to throw uh, to, throw the, to throw the fade to Cephas and it was uh, right on the money 26 yards um, and that was a real um, uh, I think that's gonna be a real demoralizing play for the Michigan defense and a real boost of confidence to that entire offense uh, and uh, the whole sort of the team's belief in that they are more than just Jonathan Taylor, even though Taylor is clearly one of um, the most special players in all of college football. So uh, yeah, uh, it was, it, it was really fun for me to watch uh, here. 
um, this weekend. So uh, anything else for you to add, Josh, before we uh, wrap up? No, I think that it's, you know, there's a very, very good chance that Wisconsin and Ohio State will be playing a best of two series. That would be, uh, I don't know, that'll be, that would definitely be interesting. I have, um, I have more faith in this Wisconsin team than I've had in a while. The, the defense is outstanding. Um, it's, it's really cool to see um, the defense be back like that. So um, I think that's going to do it for us then uh, here tonight, guys. Uh, did we miss anything? We did, unfortunately. Um, what happened? Coming, yeah, it's coming across uh, my my old uh, Telegram machine here, uh, Coach. I have to apologize when you were doing your SEC roundup. I cut you off and I buried the lead this week. Um, you know what? I was about. Oh my gosh! I hate you. I quit. <laughs> so uh, Ole Miss wasn't the only SEC team to host a Titan from the Bay Area. That's right, the San Jose State Spartans made the trip to Fayetteville, and as you'd expect, this one was a barn burner. San Jose State, probably uh, one of the five to six best teams in the state of California, taking on Arkansas, uh, easily one of the two or three best teams in the state of Arkansas. And uh, when you get a classic like this, you're going to have a lot of points, a lot of offense, um, very, very efficient football. Um, Arkansas State, excuse me, Arkansas State. How about the Razorbacks? 487 total yards of offense, 356 through the air. Uh, San Jose State, they held to just 503, total 402 through the air. Neither team rushed all that much, 131 for Arkansas, 101 for San Jose State. That's what we like to call some SEC defense with that SEC speed. If I was to highlight one thing Arkansas probably could have done better instead of only scoring 24 points and losing the game, would be um, you don't want to throw five interceptions in a game. That's usually not a recipe for success. At the end of the day, one of the most stunning upsets possible, San Jose State got the victory, 31-24. The good thing for the Razorbacks is this is not, and I repeat, not an SEC game. I know there's a lot of SEC teams out there, but San Jose State is not one of them. So they can still win the West. They only have a single defeat to Mississippi, but you figure if they can run the table, they'll have tiebreakers over Auburn, Alabama, LSU, and Texas A&M. You've got to like their chances in those games, especially considering they get some of them at home. Um, They do go to Baton Rouge and Tuscaloosa. Those are challenging environments, but I love this Arkansas team, especially when they don't throw five interceptions. Especially when they don't throw five interceptions is, uh, unfortunately for them, uh, few and far between. So I think that is going to do it for us here uh, tonight on uh, the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. So uh, on behalf of of our own offensive coordinator, the coach here in Nashville, Tennessee, and our intrepid blogging uh, blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in Chicago, Illinois. This is the professor in the Music City saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Hi, I'm Coach O, and I want to remind you, go ahead, be chicken right down here. I had to ride the game against uh, Vandy right there, huh? Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion and check out our Facebook page.